Good afternoon. I'm happy to be here with you all for today's major water announcement. I'm Mandy Gunasekara, EPA's Chief of Staff. First, a moment of business before we get started. For members of the press watching the live stream that have not yet RSVP'd and would like to ask a question during the Q&A portion, please email press at epa.gov now and they will share the call-in information. The press call will immediately follow the conclusion of today's virtual press conference. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to today's event. Before I turn it over to Administrator Wheeler for the announcement, I'd like to recognize and thank a number of special guests on today's virtual press conference. First, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, Secretary Ben Carson, Jennifer McLean, EPA's Director of the Office of Groundwater and Drinking Water, Flint, Michigan Mayor Sheldon Neely, Wisconsin State Senator Robert Cowles, Springfield, Illinois Mayor Jim Langelder, Pennsylvania State Senator Camera Bartolotta, and Jefferson County, Colorado Commissioner Libby Zabo. Thank you all for joining us today and for your support in this truly significant undertaking. And now it's my pleasure to introduce EPA Administrator Andrew Wheeler. Administrator Wheeler has dedicated his career to advancing sound environmental policies. He began his career during the Bush administration as a special assistant in the Office of Pollution Prevention and Toxics here at EPA. He later worked as a principal in the private consulting firm and served as director of the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee staff. Administrator Wheeler has been back with EPA since April 2018, and he was confirmed as EPA's 15th administrator in February 2019. Administrator Wheeler, the floor is yours. Sir, if you could unmute your line. I thought I already unmuted it. I apologize. Thank you, Mandy, and I want to thank all of our guests. Hello, everyone. I appreciate you joining us this afternoon for this historic announcement. Today, EPA is announcing the first major update to the lead and copper rule in nearly 30 years. This historic action strengthens every aspect of the lead and copper rule and will help accelerate reductions of lead in drinking water to better protect our children and communities. In older homes and buildings, Lead can leach from lead surface lines, solder and fixtures into tap water and become a significant source of lead exposure. In children, lead exposure is linked to irreversible and lifelong negative health effects, including decreased IQ, focus and academic achievement. Under the Trump administration, EPA has redoubled its efforts to take lead out of the environment. In 2018, the administration announced the Lead Action Plan, which serves as a blueprint for reducing lead exposure and associated harms. The four goals of the Lead Action Plan include reducing children's exposure to lead sources, identifying lead exposed children and improving their health outcomes, communicating more effectively with stakeholders, and supporting critical research to reduce lead exposures and related health risks. Yesterday, alongside the Department of Housing and Urban Development, EPA announced a final rule that cuts the amount of lead that can remain in dust on floors and windowsills after lead removal activities. This action will better protect from the harmful effects of lead exposure. We have also taken enforcement actions to promote compliance with lead safe work practices. And just last week, EPA and the Department of Justice announced a proposed nationwide settlement with Home Depot for alleged violations of EPA's lead renovation, repair, and painting rule, the largest lead paint settlement in history. EPA also finalized the lead-free rule that reduces lead to plumbing materials used in public water systems, homes, and schools. EPA's new lead and copper rule, which is our focus today, is really the capstone of this administration's effort to remove lead from the human environment. The new rule represents an historic step to reduce lead exposure in drinking water, and its goals are the following. First, to better protect children at elementary schools and child care centers. Second, 
to get the lead out of our nation's drinking water. And third, empower communities with better information on sources and solutions to reduce lead in drinking water. The new LCR uses science and best practices to correct shortcomings of the previous rule. And it will help ensure that all Americans have access to safe drinking water, regardless of what zip code they live in. One of the most important improvements under this rule is also the simplest. The new rule will better protect children where they learn and play. Children spend a large portion of their lives in elementary schools and child care facilities. Lead in the plumbing of these buildings and lead in pipes delivering water to these structures can pose a risk to their health. For the first time, this rule requires that community water systems test for lead in drinking water in elementary schools and child care centers that they serve. The old rule had no federal requirement for community water systems to test for lead in drinking water in these, in these buildings. This critical improvement helps ensure that children who are at increased risk from lead exposure are protected where they spend a significant amount of their time. In addition to testing obvious locations like schools, this rule uses science-based testing protocols to find more sources of lead in drinking water in homes in our communities. The old rule allowed for sampling techniques that frequently underestimated lead in the water that people drink. Based on better science, the new rule requires water systems follow new improved tap sampling measures that will better locate elevated levels of lead. One key improvement in the testing protocols is the new fifth liter sampling requirement for homes with lead service lines. To target water from a lead service line, a tester must draw four liters of water before collecting the test sample. This allows the water to more likely come from the lead service lines where the most lead is and not from the plumbing closest to the tap. In addition to finding more sources of lead, the new rule strengthens the requirements to reduce lead in the drinking water itself. The new LCR establishes a new threshold of 10 parts per billion that when exceeded jumpstarts corrosion control and actions to replace lead service lines. The 10 parts per billion trigger level requires systems that already have corrosion control to evaluate and improve their treatment. Systems that do not have corrosion control must conduct a study to identify the best treatment approach. And if that system exceeds the action level in the future, the system must install the treatment it identified in its study right away. The old rule allowed up to 48 months or four years to pass after a system exceeded the 15 parts per billion before corrosion control had to be put in place. When the 10 parts per billion threshold is triggered, water systems will also be required to start lead service line replacement. To strengthen lead service lines replacement requirements, this rule goes several steps farther by closing loopholes, accelerating the pace of lead service line replacement, and ensuring that lead pipes will be replaced in their entirety. The old rule created so many loopholes that very few utilities actually replaced lead pipes. Let me repeat that point. While the old rule theoretically included a 7% replacement rate, it was riddled with loopholes and off ramps. Since 1997, more than 14,000 water systems have had an action level exceedance for lead, but only 1% have replaced lead service lines under the rule. This means that over a 20 year period, less than 160 water systems in this country removed lead service lines after exceeding the federal action level for lead and drinking water. Again, this is out of a population of over 14,000 water systems. The media likes to say that the old rule required pipes to be replaced within 14 years. But if that were true, the problem would be solved by now. Yet thousands of homes still have lead service lines. One of the trade press articles today incorrectly reports, quote, 
leaked rule EPA doubles timeline for lead pipe removal. Nothing could be further from the truth, and this shows a profound misunderstanding of what this rule actually does. Under the new rule, water systems will be required to fully replace at least 3% of lead surface lines each year when sampling results are above the 15 parts per billion. The new rule's real 3% replacement rate will do more to remove lead surface lines than the old rule's unmet 7% rate by driving early action, closing loopholes, and strengthening replacement requirements. Let me be clear, under the old rule, even though 7% was required, we only saw 1% being replaced. So our new requirement of 3% will see three times the replacement rate than the old rule. Under the new rule, systems must have a plan in place and must start replacing lines as soon as sample results are above the trigger level. They cannot avoid replacing lead surface lines simply by testing. And we will no longer allow partial service line replacements. This is important because when a line is only partially replaced, it can actually cause short term spikes in the amount of lead in drinking water. Service lines will be replaced in their entirety. And systems will be required to replace the water system owned portion of a lead service line when a customer chooses to replace their customer owned portion of that line. Finally, for individuals, communities and local governments to take the best action, they need information, including where lead service lines are located. This new rule builds the information infrastructure needed to empower these decisions and help institutionalize best practices that are already being practiced by some cities across the country. One key improvement under EPA's new rule is that water systems nationwide must identify lead service lines and make their general locations publicly known. By providing thorough and transparent information on where these lines exist, communities can make informed decisions to reduce lead exposure. Additionally, residents with a known or potential lead surface line will be notified and receive information about what steps that they can take to reduce their exposure. Water systems will also notify homeowners and building owners about opportunities to replace these service lines. If available, systems may provide information about financial assistance to help pay for replacing the customer owned side of the line. To help communities as they make decisions about funding, EPA has compiled information about fund federal funding, case studies, and other additional resources to assist states, local, and tribal governments and water utilities. These options include the EPA's Drinking Water State Revolving Loan Fund, grants from the Water Infrastructure Improvement for the Nation Act or WIN Act, the Water Infrastructure Finance and Innovation Act, also known as WIFIA, and the Department of Housing and Urban Development's Community Development Block Grants. In closing, I want to recognize the expertise and dedication of our career scientists and staff who developed this historic rule. We are joined today by Dr. Jennifer McLean of EPA's Water Office, who helped drive this important action. I encourage you to listen and learn from her as I have. Jennifer and her team know, know an enormous amount about this subject and it's been a privilege to work with them. I also wanna thank our other speakers today on the phone, all of whom helped provide important information during the, during the drafting of this final regulation that helped guide and direct us on the right approach to take to help their communities across the country. The new LCR represents a turning point in actions to reduce lead in this nation's drinking water. It builds on the leadership of cities and communities across the country it is an historic action to reduce exposure to lead in our environment and to better protect our children and our future generations. In sum, this rule provides for better testing and science to identify where the problems are. It requires more replacements to take place than ever before. And three, it gets more information out to the public with the inventory 
and the school and daycare testing. Thank you, and I'd like to turn it back over to Mandy. Okay, thank you, Administrator Wheeler, for those remarks and for that big announcement. Um, it is now my honor to introduce a great partner for EPA in this entire process, the U.S. Housing and Urban Development Secretary, Ben Carson. For nearly 30 years, Secretary Carson served as Director of Pediatric Neurosurgery at the Johns Hopkins Children's Center, a position he assumed when he was just 33 years old, becoming the youngest major division director in the hospital's history. Born in Detroit to a single mother with a third grade education who worked multiple jobs to support their family, Secretary Carson was raised to love reading and education. He graduated from Yale University and earned his MD from the University of Michigan Medical School. He and his wife are the proud parents of three adult sons and three grandchildren. Secretary Carson was sworn in as the 17th Secretary of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development on March 2nd, 2017. Thank you, Secretary Carson, for being with us today, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much uh, for that wonderful introduction, and it's so uh, wonderful to be with you. It's been just great working with Administrator Wheeler and um, with Secretary DeVos and all the people who've worked so hard to make this happen. Today's update to the lead copper rule is an incredibly important step toward guaranteeing safe resources for children all across the country, including children in the 5 million families to which HUD provides housing assistance. Now, during my time as a pediatric neurosurgeon, I saw firsthand the importance of a healthy environment, not only for physical, but also the mental well-being of a family. And it was uh, traumatic for me every, every time I had to send a young child home from the hospital. And I knew they were not returning to a healthy home environment. And that's why I applaud today's announcement from the EPA, as well as our coordinated efforts at HUD and the Department of Education to ensure the health and safety of children across America, from schools to homes to neighborhood communities. The average American spends about 90% of his or her time indoors, including 70% in their home. And unsurprisingly, there's strong evidence to suggest that the condition of the home plays a significant role in a person's well being. Yet nearly 30 million homes in the United States are estimated to have indoor environmental hazards, poor housing conditions, which range from roofing problems to deteriorated lead paint to inadequate plumbing. These are all associated with a variety of adverse health effects such as lead poisoning. The agencies represented here today firmly believe that no family should have to worry about hidden hazards tucked away in the corners of their home or their community. As a neurosurgeon, a father, and a grandfather, I cannot overstate how pleased I am with the progress today's announcement represents in the fight for healthy environments for kids everywhere. This administration is deeply committed to ensuring that all of our most vulnerable citizens are shielded from the effects of lead. And this announcement is an incredibly important step in fulfilling that promise. So thank you to everyone. God bless and Merry Christmas. Okay, thank you, Secretary Carson, for your words and for your partnership and expertise as we have worked to move this update across the finish line. It is now my honor to introduce um, our next speaker, who will be Jennifer McLean. Jennifer is the director of EPA's Office of Groundwater and Drinking Water. Without the hard work of her and her team, we would not be here today. So Jennifer, I'll hand the floor over to you. Thank you, Mandy. Good afternoon, everyone. Today's final lead and copper rule is a significant accomplishment for EPA's drinking water program and EPA's work in reducing exposure to lead. This final rule represents the collaboration, coordination, and consultation of EPA staff at all levels and with stakeholders and scientific experts. 
I want to thank my team and the many career staff across the Environmental Protection Agency that have worked some for decades to better protect our communities from lead and drinking water. I also want to thank them for their hard work on this rule. Today we are announcing a new lead and copper rule. I want to talk a little bit about the improvements to the rule and expand on the administrator's remarks on how the rule will better protect children and get the lead out of drinking water and empower communities through information. First, I want to stress that this rule isn't about a single requirement or a single number. It is a set of interrelated actions that will reduce lead in drinking water by identifying and targeting locations with elevated levels of lead. It allows people to better understand where the sources of lead are in their communities and whether there are high levels of lead in their drinking water. Under the new rule, water systems will find the sources of lead in their water, connect with their communities through improved communication, put plans in place, and take more actions sooner to reduce lead. Let me repeat that point. The final rule requires systems to take more actions sooner to reduce lead. Creating a lead service line inventory is one of the first actions that will be required of water systems. Service lines connect our homes to the water main, and millions of these lines across the country are made of lead, but systems don't know the location of most of them. By taking this first action, water systems will raise awareness of lead sources in their community, better find where to test homes for lead in drinking water, and proactively plan for and prioritize lead service line replacements. A significant component of the new rule is the more stringent sampling that will better identify higher levels of lead. The rule requires water systems to adjust their sampling sites to target locations with lead service lines. Systems will be required to follow new and improved sampling procedures. For example, this means that systems with lead service lines will now sample by collecting water that has been in contact with the lead service line, and this is the fifth liter sample. This, in combination with other sampling improvements, such as using wide mouth bottles and preventing flushing before testing, will give systems a more accurate understanding of the levels of lead in their drinking water, and as a result, will prompt more actions to reduce lead in drinking water. Systems will also have to pay attention to individual locations with elevated levels of lead. This new requirement addresses another issue in the old rule. For any home that has a sample with a lead level above 15 parts per billion, the system will be required to conduct a find and fix protocol by collecting follow-up samples to identify the cause and mitigating the problem. With these science-driven improvements to testing, elevated levels of lead won't be under the radar anymore. And this is what makes the new trigger level so important. The new trigger level gives systems an early warning that their water is too corrosive. When a system exceeds 10 parts per billion, they'll be triggered into requirements for proactive planning and actions to reduce lead. Large systems that exceed the trigger level will be required to implement a goal-based lead service line replacement program. Because they will have an inventory and a lead service line replacement plan already in place, the systems will be able to take action right away. The trigger level also requires systems to reevaluate existing corrosion control treatment to better control lead and requires systems without this treatment to conduct a study so that, if, so that they are prepared if their system exceeds the action level. If a system exceeds the action level, the plans in place will allow the, allow the system to take immediate action to optimize their treatment and replace lead service lines. The new rule also ensures that systems ex that exceed the 15 part per billion action level will actually remove lead service lines. Very few systems are, are replacing lead service lines under the current rule. This new rule won't slow down the removal of lead service lines. In fact, it will prompt the removal of more lines. Under the new rule, systems must have an inventory and plan in place so they can start replacing lines as soon as sample results are above the trigger level. Water systems that exceed the action level will be required to fully replace at least 3% of the lead service lines per year. Systems can't avoid replacing these lines simply by testing out. Systems cannot discontinue replacing lead service lines until their lead levels have dropped below the action level for at least two years, and systems will be driven to replace the full lead service line. EPA understands that there's a cost associated with replacing a lead service line, 
and there are communities and customers that don't have the resources to readily remove these lines. So the rule requires that water systems develop a financial assistance strategy ahead of time as part of their lead service line replacement plan. External funding, such as federal or state grants or loans, can help. Federal sources might include the EPA's Drinking Water State Revolving Fund that has funded over, for, over $44.5 billion in drinking water infrastructure projects, including lead service line removal since its inception. Another example is the recent EPA announcement of wind grants to provide $40 million in funding to reduce lead and drinking water in disadvantaged communities and schools. As the administrator mentioned, EPA is maintaining a list of funding sources that can be used for lead and drinking water reduction activities on our website. And we've also developed a resource guide to help small and disadvantaged communities identify potential federal funding sources for lead service line replacement and technical assistance related to lead service line removal. The, the new final lead and copper rule also focuses on protecting the most vulnerable young children. The rule now requires community water systems to conduct sampling at the facilities that serve the most sensitive age group, young children, and in childcare facilities in elementary schools. And it provides a framework for systems to provide testing to secondary and elementary schools and childcare facilities upon request. Finally, the rule builds upon existing public education requirements with many improvements. Communities will be quickly informed within 24 hours of an action level exceedance. Individual households whose tap samples exceed 15 parts per billion will be informed within three days. Community members will have access to information about lead service lines in their community. Customers with a lead service line will be annually notified and be provided with information about the actions they can take to reduce their exposure. New customers will be informed about the presence of a lead service line when they establish new water service. The rule also enables enhanced collaboration between water systems, health departments, and school and child care facility managers to reduce lead and drinking water at schools and child care facilities. Implementing all of these actions together under the new rule will have a significant impact on reducing lead in drinking water across this country. Moving forward, EPA will be working with water systems, states, tribes, technical assistance providers, schools and communities to prepare them to implement the rule. We anticipate that the final rule will be published in the coming weeks. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. Um, now I would like to welcome the mayor of Flint, Michigan, Sheldon Neely. Mayor, please take it away. Thank you for that, Mandy. And I want to just start off by saying that this is a great day that God has made. Uh, listening to all the speakers, uh, listening to the details of this new lead copper rule put forth by the federal government uh, for our nation to protect our greatest asset. And our greatest asset as a country is our children. To face the same challenges that the city of Flint has to face over the past six years. We do understand that this announcement is about progress, not perfection. We do know that there, we have to understand that there's more work to be done, and we are stepping up to the challenge to do that work that's necessary to protect our greatest asset. So it's about prayer, planning, and partnership. And I encourage everyone that's listening to this press conference, listening to the details of where we are and what we, steps we're going to be making to move forward to eliminate uh, the element of lead in our areas uh, throughout our nation to protect our greatest assets, and that's our children. I repeat that so many times because I want people to recognize um, that no child should have to overcome the um, negative impact of lead in their lives. And so these announcements, though it's, uh, it's not perfection, but it is progress. And I want the world to know that Flint is gonna get better and we're gonna continuously get better with these type of announcements. Uh, we service to be replaced here in the city of Flint. And so we want the rest of the nation to take note, uh, use the city of Flint as a lighthouse of hope, saying that we overcome uh, or overcoming these things, these challenges that no one should ever have to overcome. We're much more than a community of victims, but we are a community of victors and we're going to overcome these things working together. Uh, we should not have to overcome the challenges of partisan politics or gamemanship as it relates to these things that protects the quality of life for families throughout our country. 
This is a great nation and we are a great country once we unite our efforts and partnership to overcome these things. And so this announcement is about progress, not perfection. Thank you. I return it back to you, Mandy. Great, thank you, Mayor Neely, and uh, amen to that. Thank you for your partnership, uh, certainly with our Region 5 and with the rest of the EPA folks, as we've certainly looked to uh, address the issues in Flint and then use that to ensure that that doesn't face any other American communities um, in this great nation. So thank you for your comments. Now I will turn it over to Wisconsin State Senator Robert Cowles. Um, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mandy. Am I on? You are. You're on. Okay. Thank you very much, Mandy. Thank you to the EPA and all of you for for this excellent event today. Um, I just want to say I've known about the problems that high lead exposure can create for to problems with uh, especially young people for quite a while, but it wasn't until several years ago that I really began to dive into the behavioral, developmental, and health issues that lead poisoning can pose for Wisconsin's youth whether it's in the classroom, in the home, or in the community. That's why I authored 2017 Wisconsin Act 137 with the help of my excellent staff, Evan, Tony, and Jason. We called it the Leading on Lead Act. It gave communities another tool to help rid our state of this terrible antiquated infrastructure. Uh, continuing to be explored by other local governments, so far eight cities in our state have adopted resolutions to offer partial grants or loans with utility funds to remove customer side lead laterals as they replace the public side laterals and mains. One community that utilized the Leading on Lead Act, and as we call it, Green Bay, uh, which is also my hometown, finished the removal of their le last lead lateral just a few months ago. But this is just one effort in one state, as you all know, and if, if I've learned anything, it's is that we need many tools in the toolbox as part of a larger effort to gather the data and propose solutions to lead poisoning. That's why I'm very glad the EPA has broken nearly 30 years of stagnation and taken the initiative now to prioritize addressing uh, removal of lead. Uh, the revised lead and copper rule makes common sense, comprehensive changes that will help to better identify problems and launch localized remediation strategies that benefit uh, many Americans across our great nation. I'm particularly happy to see mandated lead testing in elementary schools and child care facilities. In the last legislation, legislative session, I undertook an effort with two bills collectively known as supporting children's health by ousting outdated lead, or as we call it, school for short, this revision to the LCR will help support this statewide effort and others across the nation, which I plan to reintroduce in 2021 to help ensure that clean water is delivered to the population most vulnerable to lead-laden water. With any issue as complex as lead water infrastructure, it takes a host of solutions. The revised LCR is a substantial milestone in our continued efforts to remove lead from our communities. Now, all three levels of government must continue our collective push for safer water. Whether it's local efforts such as those taken by Green Bay, statewide efforts such as those I've led in other communities in Wisconsin, or federal efforts such as the laudable LCR revisions or making funding available to implement remediation strategies, it's pivotal that all levels of government continue to learn from each other's approaches and stay involved in the fight to invest in our future by protecting children's health. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Senator. Thank you for your comments. And now I would like to turn things over to the mayor of Springfield, Illinois, Jim Langelder. Sir, please take it away. You may need to unmute the system. Thank you. Thank you, Mandy. Thank you, Administrator Wheeler and HUD Secretary Ben Carson for your leadership with this important initiative with the lead copper rule, which is decades in the making. 
Um, I know when I'm a legacy mayor, my father was mayor over 30 years ago, and we faced the same struggles back then with uh, lead poisoning in our water systems or the effects of those in houses, things of that nature, and it impacts our inner city. And I really like to acknowledge uh, my colleague, Mayor Neely in Flint, Michigan. Uh, it's through our struggles together that we really overcome them and learn from one another and how we can move forward in a better path. And special thanks to Regional Administrator Thede, who came to Springfield and saw firsthand what EPA's support has done for the city of Springfield in switching out our uh, lead copper piping in certain areas. But the uh, infrastructure needs of all communities across our country is great, but it's uh, one that we can accomplish together through the EPA as well as HUD, working together with the local mayors and uh, our states as well. But we really appreciate this initiative because what it will do is not only provide for our greatest asset, which are our children, as Mayor Neely had said, but also the vital resource of water. That is the vital resource for all communities' future. Doesn't matter where you live. And we really appreciate uh, the EPA and HUD really recognizing this important factor to help all our communities grow. Okay. Thank you, Mayor, for your comments. And we will now turn to our next speaker. It's Pennsylvania State Senator Camera Bartolotta. Please take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And um, I truly applaud the EPA and the administration for taking this vital step in a positive direction. Here in Pennsylvania, we have numerous areas and communities that have a, a very challenging lead problem, not just in our communities, but again, in the schools and public buildings. And I am very excited about this announcement and I applaud the EPA for doing so. Our responsibility as elected officials is for the health and welfare of every citizen in our community, our state and our country. And this will go a very, very long way in assuring our citizens, our parents of young children that we're doing everything we can to assure that health and welfare. One of the things that I've been concerned about recently is in an area of my district in Aliquippa and the antiquated uh, systems, the water lines in those, those areas and a very high level of lead for various reasons. And a lot of our areas that we represent are of lower economic means. There's a lot of blight, there's a lot of issues and these individuals don't, the, the water authorities don't have the resources uh, where they can replace a lot of these lines. And I am very encouraged and thankful that this initiative is coming to fruition and it's going to alleviate a lot of the economic burden on replacing these lines and uh, showing our constituents and our, our parents and our, our teachers and, and all of those individuals who are at high risk for, uh, for lead in their, their systems that we're doing everything we can. Help is on the way. And uh, I, I just applaud the EPA for doing this. And I'm very grateful that we are looking at this because from Aliquippa to Philadelphia in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, every community across the Commonwealth has some issue or, or another when it deals with lead exposure in the water systems. And one other thing too, and I'm sure that uh, uh, Secretary um, Carson will, will agree um, he's had many, many uh, speeches about blight in urban areas and depressed areas. And we also understand that when we tear down some of those old buildings with that lead paint, there's a, a dust situation and a remediation situation whereby a lot of that lead gets into our waterways. So this is this initiative is going to go a very long way with at least eliminating a huge portion of that problem with these lines coming into our, our older homes and our buildings, especially our schools. We've got to protect our kids. And I thank you uh, to, to the administration, to the EPA and uh, everyone involved. I truly appreciate your, your hard work. So thank you and thank you for letting me be part of today's announcement. Thank you, Senator. And now I would like to turn things over to our last, but certainly not our least speaker for today. I'd like to welcome Jefferson County, Colorado Commissioner Libby Zabo. 
Thank you, Mandy. And I first want to just say good afternoon and Merry Christmas to all. And as everyone has spoken, we all have uh, similar issues in our community where um, sometimes like in mine, there are very old areas of my community and there are very new. And we need to bring up those older communities to make sure they're as safe as the newer communities. And I wanna just say thank you to the team at the EPA and at HUD for bringing this historical action. It's not only going to make the water our children and communities drink every day safer, but by removing the government bureaucracies and closing the previous loopholes that have hindered the elimination of lead in our older buildings and especially our schools, we can be true to our commitment of delivering the clean drinking water that we all cherish as Americans and in every community in America. You know, to use science and transparency to make sure that we're identifying where the lead service lines are and quickly getting them removed and new safe lines put in, that will only empower our communities and our citizens to not only know if there is an issue of lead in their area, but to also know how and when that issue will be rectified. That will help our communities to rest easy, that their drinking water is safe. So let's get the lead out. You know, this new LCR rule will also, has been a long time coming and it will showcase the great innovation and transparency in the work the EPA has done under Administrator Wheeler and Deputy Administrator Benevento. I have to give my hometown boy a show, shout out. And their commitment and dedication to the American people to have clean drinking water. Like for the first time, making sure that every school is tested for lead in their water. That seems like a no brainer, but we haven't been doing that to identify and make public the locations of these service lines. This is the type of openness every American wants and deserves out of their government agencies. And I applaud the EPA and HUD on their commitment to creating a safe America for all of us to live in. Thank you for the opportunity of being part of this today. It is, it, it is an honor for me. And again, I hope you all have a very Merry Christmas celebrating with your families. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Zabo and uh, Deputy Administrator Benevento will be especially appreciative of the shout out from Colorado. Um, now, before uh, we officially move over to the Q&A portion of the press call, um, I would like to hand things back over to Administrator Wheeler to close the virtual press conference out. Thank you, Mandy. And I again want to thank the EPA team for all the hard work that has gone into this rulemaking today. Um, there are a lot of hours, a lot of modeling, a lot of um, information. We had a lot of comments during the comment during the public comment um, function of this and we received a lot of good input and a lot of good comments from people across the country so people who are tuning in to watch this i want to thank you for participating in this regulatory effort um, this rule first time in 30 years it's been updated and the science has changed a lot in the last 30 years not just the science as far as the impact of lead but also the science as far as how we detect it how we treat it, and the improvements we've made on the lead service line replacements. So this was truly a huge undertaking, and I want to thank all, the entire staff for everything that they did. I also want to thank our guests today. I want to thank my um, my federal partner and friend, Ben Carson from HUD. Thank you, Secretary Carson, for your leadership on lead. As a physician, I turn to you time and time again for the for information on what we are doing as far as the health impacts on children in particular. And I want to thank our guests from across the country, Mayor Neely, Senator Cowles, Mayor Langfelder, Senator Bartolotta, and Commissioner Zabo, representing states from across the country, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Colorado, Wisconsin, Michigan. It shows you 
Um, it shows everyone tuning in today that this is a problem across the entire country. I want to thank you all for being leaders on this issue in your home states, in your home communities, and for helping to provide information to the agency and to the federal government on what we should be doing as a federal government. So thank you for your local leadership, your state leadership, and thank you for helping us make the best decisions possible on behalf of the American public. The mission of the EPA is to protect public health and the environment, and we are certainly fulfilling our mission today, as we do every day. With that, happy holidays to everyone. Hope you have a very Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, whatever you celebrate. It's a time to reflect, to be with family, and this is a rule at the heart of which protects our families. Thank you.